Okay, so uh, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Robert McCall. I work here at uh, Deltaris. I work on uh, coastal hazards and coastal risk. Uh, I'm uh, moderating this session today. Uh, and here with me is also uh, Floyd Hulfink, who's uh, going to be uh, the rapporteur for this session. Uh, I've got some slides here as an introduction uh, to, to the workshop today. Um, and then we'll quickly move on to the, to the presentations. So as, as you all know, um, this is all part of the, the SAM PS project, uh, aiming to help uh, adaptation modeling and policy support and looking at how adaptation models can better support these efforts and what recommendations uh, should be brought into the new EU adaptation strategy. Um, as part of the project, we've been working on a, on a desk review of models and policies. Uh, and we've looked at um, 24 different case studies spanning uh, nine use cases. Uh, and of those use cases, two are related to urban and regional adaptation. They were the support of city adaptation and uh, climate resilient river basins and agriculture planning and coastal zone management. And I think as you've seen earlier today, there, are six, there were six case studies uh, related to those in groups C8 and C10, and we'll be looking at some of those uh, today and just discussing them in more, in more detail. I mean, the preliminary findings that uh, I think Art was talking about earlier uh, is that there's a need for um, integrated uh, adaptation plans, but you know, all the, the tools we have are fairly disciplinary. The adaptation models are often quite complex and need to translate it somehow uh, better. Uh, we need to somehow bring in open data sources better and uh, include the behavioral responses uh, into these kinds of uh, tools. And I think through this workshop, we'll be able to look at those findings a little bit better. So obviously in this workshop here, it's uh, one of the parallel workshops, we're focusing on the urban and regional adaptation modeling. And what we'd like to do is, is complement the review uh, that was already carried out um, in this workshop uh, and encourage some uh, some discussion and um, uh, um, um, multidisciplinary approach. Um, in particular though, if we're, when we're looking at the, the case studies, I think there's three uh, questions that we'd like to pose and discuss. And there's one is about, okay, what, what decisions are supported in this, in this case study, uh, both those that maybe the tool is designed for, maybe there are other things that we could also support with the same kinds of tools. I think another point to discuss is what is the current capacity of this tool uh, and other tools that are similar to it. And most importantly, when we're looking at um, recommendations for, for the EU uh, research in the future, is what do we need as we move into the future? So what developments are needed uh, for the next five to 10 years and how can we best get there? So those are three things I think we'd like to discuss after each of the presentations. So if you bear that in mind uh, in the discussion period. This is our program for today. Uh, obviously here I'm giving a, a quick introduction to the, uh, to the workshop. Then we have four presentations centered around the case studies, um, which will introduce everyone individually um, as they come up. Um, they will all be uh, 15 minutes. And then at the end, we have a five minutes to, to wrap up and finish by one. Um, for the workshop guidelines, uh, as I think you all know, this workshop is being recorded. Uh, the presentations will be 10 to 12 minutes, followed by three to five minutes for questions and discussion, uh, especially focusing around those three questions that uh, I presented earlier. As participants, I'd ask you please to contribute as much as you can, uh, as, as much as you feel comfortable doing. Um, please, uh, during the presentation, um, keep your microphone muted. Uh, 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 but uh, you can either raise your hand uh, as an option or uh, put something in the, uh, in the chat function if you would like to ask a question. I see something coming up here. Uh, but that was, the, that was my introduction at the moment. Do, do I already see questions? No. Okay, then I would like to introduce um, 
The first uh, speaker for today is uh, Judith de Maat, also here at Deltares. He's going to be looking at um, uh, a, a, a planning tool for, for water, more at the regional level, um, focused around the, the Rhine. And with that, I think I have to stop sharing my screen, and then uh, Judith can start sharing her screen. Um, you did that we can't uh, yes. Oh, yes can you hear me yeah okay uh, good morning everybody um, my name is Jita Tamat I'm working at Delta Aris, uh, the applied research institute on water management that's based in the Netherlands uh, I mostly work in the field of uh, water scarcity and drought uh, supporting policy making and I'm also leading uh, at the Tyrus the strategic research program on information systems for water security. And um, as already discussed this morning, um, we see a uh, growing need for strategic planning about water availability, taking into account uh, climate change impacts and also uh, because of increasing population and therefore a growing water demand. And to support this, uh, data and information platforms are uh, valuable tools to support informed and interactive decision making. And what you see is also in the Rhine Basin, this is the case, and tools are under development. Uh, in the Rhine, we already have a long tradition in the, uh, of cooperation together on floods but less on drought, that's starting now. After the drought in 2018, it gets more attention. And um, the upcoming 10 minutes, I will give a presentation about the rapid development of, um, of a scenario planning tool for water availability um, that me and my project team are developing for the Rhine. Uh, we do this upon the request of the International Committee of uh, Commission for the Hydrology of the Rhine Basin and the Dutch government. In cooperation with other experts, for example, uh, Enno Nielsen, who works at the Water Balance Forecasting and Predictions Department in the Bundesantal für Gewasserkunde in Germany. Um, the Rhine Basin, here on the right hand side, you see the different countries, is one of uh, Europe's major transboundary river basin and it covers like 185,000 square kilometers and is home to uh, 60 million inhabitants. And uh, almost one third of these inhabitants or people are depending on the production of water, of drinking water from this Rhine River. And, um, and furthermore, the Rhine is also a natural habitat for a diversity of plant life and many birds, fish, and other species, as well as, uh, for example, navigation from the port of Rotterdam up to uh, Germany. It's an important um, inland shipping corridor. Um, the Rhine countries have a long tradition in cooperation, and um, the oldest one is the Commission for the Navigation of the Rhine that was already established in the 19th century. And um, in addition, there um, is another committee that's focusing on sustainability of, of, um, of successful restoration of the river, River Rhine, after um, the pollution incident of what happened in Switzerland and that affected the total of all countries in the Rhine Basin. And that's the International Commission for the Protection of the Rhine. And then there's a third committee and that's more focusing on uh, providing scientific information that's also supporting the other two commissions that are more focusing on policy making. And that scientific committee is the uh, International Commission Commission for the Hydrology of the Rhine Basin that was established in 1975. And uh, for a long time, um, it was mostly focusing on flooding and uh, pollution or protecting 
uh, the rain from pollution. But now the uh, focus is shifting to water availability and the impact of water use on the discharge of the rain. Um, that's why the uh, CHR wants to generate insights in water availability and demand in the whole Rhine River Basin. And it wants to take into account both climate change, but also social economic scenario impacts. And um, because it's a transboundary corporation, it's very important to involve a wide variety of stakeholders from all countries and also from different disciplines. And um, to contribute, to make a climate resilience uh, river based planning plans and development of water scarcity strategies, uh, we are now developing um, a scenario tool. And for this, we make use of the Blue Earth digital environment, um, in, which includes data, tools, and um, uh, models to support this planning process with involvement of the different stakeholders. And what kind of uh, decisions should be supported? We, um, the tool uh, will facilitate all kind of what if analysis in the field of, uh, for example, land use changes. So what happens if the agricultural area will change and what will happen if um, agricultural needs more water because of climate change impacts. So there's a shift from rain fed agriculture to irrigated agriculture, um, or also, for example, a change in reservoir operational management. Um, if, for example, uh, because of more drought periods, uh, more reservoirs are built, and what is the impact on the discharge of the Rhine, and for example, the impact on navigation. Um, because uh, there was a previous project, and, and the CHR has a special interest in water consumption for irrigation and cooling, because it was stated in the previous project that this will have a major impact or could have a major impact on the discharge of the Rhine. For example, um, the water consumption can increase from 50 cubic meters per second to 200 cubic meters per second in summer time. And during low flow periods, uh, 1000 cubic meters per second enters the Netherlands. So that would uh, mean that uh, there will be a significant change, for example, for the impact for the Netherlands. And uh, for the development of the scenario tools, we use the Blue Earth Digital Environment. It's a platform that Deltaris uh, has developed. Um, it consists of three pillars. Uh, one is the data. We put data centric. We want to make optimum use of reliable data sets, of global data sets that are rapidly develop, um, are developed. Um, the second component is the engine um, that refers to all kind of models and tools that will help you to set up uh, quickly a model, and that also will to help you to organize uh, your model workflow and to um, visualize a model results. And the third component is making the interaction between the planning process and um, the tooling. So in co-creation, make information available for the policy makers. Uh, in the upcoming slides, I will go into more detail about these three components for uh, the RAM. So as a basic, we used um, the online re uh, repository for open access, global data sets um, that the virus has developed for, and that's called Blue Earth Data. It's online. Um, you can find all kind of uh, data sets um, that are public available, are ranging from um, earth observation data sets, for example, about reservoirs levels, but also um, digital terrain models or 
also outcome of models like rainfall runoff models all over the world and also storm surge models. And what we did, we took out the data um, for the Rhine Basin uh, to as a start. And for um, we made a geo data web viewer in which it's easily to explore all, all kind of data sets um, for the Rhine Basin. For example, the digital elevation model that is also input for uh, for the rainfall runoff model um, and uh, used put this basic data in the model. And for this, we develop all kind of uh, uh, scripts to be, uh, that allows you easy to set up your model for a kind of a three-click approach. So it's easy, it's already accommodated to have your model up and running quickly. And um, to have all these kind of models, to connect them easily, like a rainfall runoff model or water use, cooling, and uh, water allocation, uh, we developed the computational framework uh, powered by Delft's views uh, to run, analyze, and visualize your model results smoothly. And um, that's an uh, extension of um, Delft views that is normally used in operational systems, but now can also be used for strategic planning. So it better facilitate also um, modeling measures um, and strategies. Um, to make the connection uh, with the decision makers, um, they sometimes struggle to understand or make good use of modeling information or data sets. Um, and this can be due to a lack of understanding regarding the data sets and information that's being presented. Or uh, more often because the information is not presented in a way to illustrate its implications on key decision making factors. And um, that's, we want to uh, provide meanings or tooling that helps to effectively, effectively process or communicate and visualize these data or information from the Blue Earth tools, Blue Earth data. And for an example here is shown is a dashboard that we made for um, the Bangladesh a Delta plan where you can easily compare different scenarios, different solutions on meaningful indicators that were discussed uh, with uh, the, the stakeholders upfront to generate the information they need to make the decision. And that's also under discussion now with the uh, Rhine countries. Then I come to my uh, conclusion. Um, how could Blue Earth contribute to a recommended approach for these rapid analysis and rapid deployment of um, models? Um, I believe that uh, Blue Earth is ethical anywhere in the world. Um, we already used it besides the Rhine, also for the Ganges, Bangladesh, uh, Egypt and uh, other countries. And uh, a next step in the development is um, incorporate uh, local knowledge and local data sets. Um, because now with this tooling, you can get your process up and running fast and discuss with stakeholders. But the next step is to bring in local knowledge, incorporate local data sets um, together with the stakeholders uh, to improve the reliability of the of the model results. And this is also the next step that we will take in the Rhine case in cooperation with the Rhine countries. Um, and currently the focus is on, uh, for this tooling is on river basin management. But I think the, um, the concept itself about data and connecting to models and tools and connecting to um, dashboards or other uh, tooling that interact with um, decision makers is also applicable in other domains like the urban context. Um, 
Yeah, thank you. Then I'm coming to the end of my presentation and I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this presentation. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah, you did. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, indeed, I'd like to sort of open the floor, as it were, for questions. I saw that um, Bart van der Herk has a question in the chat, which I can, I can read. How does the market of Blue Earth-like applications look like? Are similar systems being reviewed in the SAMS BS project? Uh, has it got unique characteristics? Uh, so maybe at least uh, for the first part, uh, Judith, uh, you have an idea on that. Um, yeah, uh, the market is more like, um, because there is a lot of uh, global data sets and uh, with global coverage, but we think um, it's, uh, we want to make it useful on the local level and the regional level. So you could think of um, uh, governments that are making national water plans or transboundary water management plans or uh, river basin plans. Um, that want to start this process um, in a fast way to decide upon what should be looked into further. Um, and I think normally there's a lot of discussion going on about building models and um, it takes a lot of time. And uh, also it's difficult to specify uh, what kind of information you need. And I think this can help to put it quickly on the table and to sharpen the discussion and get more clarity about what, it, what are the needs of the stakeholders. Okay, thank you, Judith. Um, I'm just looking, I think we have, yes, time for this one other question that came in, Eduardo. Um, and then we'll have to move on. Uh, so the question, uh, can Blue Earth be applied in large basins to consider impact of reoperation of reservoirs and dynamic water allocation, such as water markets? It certainly can include uh, operation of reservoirs and also optimization of the operational uh, management of reservoirs. Um, so um, um, to calculate what is uh, uh, the optimal distribution from different point of views. Um, so uh, optimizing between different countries or different regions or so on. Um, and um, dynamic water allocation about water markets. Um, yeah, yeah, it's not it's not focusing yet on uh, the public sector or private sector and market uh, items, but I think it's easy to connect all these transboundary disciplines uh, approaches. Okay. Uh Thank you, Judith. Again, thank you for your presentation and, uh, and the discussion afterwards. I would also I'd like to say, so I've read these questions. If you would, of course, like to pose a question yourself, uh, feel free to do so and uh, raise your hand and then uh, we can just, uh, yeah, you can ask a question. If you type it into the box, then I will assume that I, uh, I'll read it. Um, with that, though, thank you again. I'd like to move to our second speaker, uh, Dionisio Perez Blanco from University of Salamanca and CMCC. Is going to be talking about uh, hydro micro macro and macroeconomic modeling for agricultural decision making. So, Dionisio, I'd like to ask if you could start sharing your screen and uh, give your presentation. Sure. Um, it should be working now. Is it working now? Yes, we can see. Okay, you. perfect. Do you see my screen now? So the, the, the PowerPoint? Uh... Yes, I can see okay. the weight systems modeling hierarchy. Okay, great. Um, yeah, well, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you, Robert, for the, for the introduction. Um, today, I'm going to, to focus on um, the human system part of uh, hydroeconomic modeling. Um, I'm trying to focus on the micro macroeconomic applications that we can, we can that can be used for for integrated human water systems modeling, uh, which is a topic that has been discussed in the in the in the previous issue in the, in the previous sessions. Many 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 speakers have underlined the need for integrated social approaches into our our models, 
and this is what I'm trying to do today in, the, in, this, in this presentation. I will show an application uh, of um, coupled economic and hydrologic modeling. Uh, in the, well, the, the examples I'm going to show uh, are for, uh, for two Spanish basins, but we have already used this model successfully in, in Italy as well. Um, I, I would like to, to show you some insightful results and show potential applications for, for these tools. So um, what's the approach that we are going to adopt for, the, for this sort of uh, hydroeconomic modeling? Well, we are going to adopt a modeling hierarchy um, in which we are going to represent the interconnected dynamics. We're going to focus on the representation of the interconnected dynamics between human and water systems. So basically with this, uh, with this model hierarchy, what we are doing is following a protocol-based uh, modular approach in which each, uh, each module in the in the modeling framework represents one system one specific system um, as the presentation already points out uh, as, as the title of the presentation already points out we are going to focus on three systems three very particular systems which are the logic system the microeconomic system and the macroeconomic system so we have two uh, economic systems which belong to the human system and one hydrologic system which belongs to the to the water to the water system um, the, the motivation for for this approach uh, well there has been many, many different papers that, that focus on the need for, for a hierarchy of models. Um, but well, basically the need, I mean, the, 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 the availability of a, of a hierarchy of, of, of models um, gives us the, the, the ability to look into the uh, dynamics of each model and understand them. So the focus here is on trying to understand how each of the systems work rather than having high-end simulations, which of course is also a, an objective we would like to have uh, the, as, as, as best ca the pr pr predictive capacity as possible. But basically with this approach, the most important thing is to understand how each system work, uh, works and how they are interconnected between them. Um, the hierarchies can be, can be also used for rapid assessment. Uh, this one in particular hasn't been, ha hasn't been used that far for a rapid assessment because every time we wanted to use it, we needed to set up first of all the database, then calibrate the models and then run everything. So we started from scratch. Every, in every case, we, we wanted to apply this, this system uh, following the requests of particular stakeholders in Spain and Italy. But once we have it running, uh, we, can, we can conduct uh, rapid assessments in less than one, than one day. But obviously to set up the model, you need some, some time. Um, well, this is the, the, the modeling hierarchy and how it works. So as I said, we're going to have three modules, the microeconomic module, the macroeconomic module, and the hydrologic module. Um, the macroeconomic module uh, works as the hint between the uh, human and water systems in the application that we have developed because we are trying to assess uh, the impact of economic instruments. So basically, when we have an, an economic instrument such as pricing or a restriction in the water availability, the first response, the shock, and the first response comes from the microeconomic system, from the water users. And this is why the microeconomic model here is at the center, but it could be different. For example, if we were to assess a climate shock, we will be impacting first the hydrologic, uh, the hydrologic module. Um, here, the climate shocks are included, but as a scenario, so it's not the, the shock itself. Um, so let's see how the hierarchy works in, in practice with two examples. Um, so for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to focus on how the different systems interact in groups of two. So we're going to focus first how, on how the hydrologic and the microeconomic module interact. And then we're going to focus on how the microeconomic module and the macroeconomic module interact. As I said, the microeconomic module is the hint, so it's implied in all the different assessments that we have made thus far on economic instruments. Uh, but just so that you know, it's possible to conduct the assessment with all the three modules together. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a feasible approach as well, but just for sake of simplicity, we're going to focus on these two. The integration between, these, between the models works uh, through um, a recursive approach. So basically what we do is run simulation first in one module, which is completely dependent. We have a full-fledged module in, within each system, within each module. Uh, we run the simulation in that, in that module. And then we see how the outputs of the simulation impact the, the, other, the other module, for example, from the micro to the hydrologic module. We assess the impact in the hydrologic module running another independent simulation. And then we come back to the microeconomic module in a recursive, pro in a recursive process until we find the convergence between the two, two systems. So without further ado, let's start with the, with, the first, uh, with the first application in which we integrated our microeconomic model with the hydrologic model. 
Um, here you have the, I, I tried to show in this slide why we think that this approach is relevant, uh, why we think that integrating human systems into, uh, and water systems into hydro, into hydroeconomic analysis uh, is important. Uh, as you can see here, to the, in the right hand side of the slide, you see what you would get, what would be the responses in terms of land use if you apply uh, an hydrologic model such as SWAT in this case, without considering an economic model. And basically what you have is that land use remains constant throughout all the simulations. In this case, we are applying simulations in which we reduce the water allocation. Uh, and as you can see, basically what, what farmers are, are doing is just reducing the amount of water applied to each crop, but basically essentially the, the, the land allocated to each crop remains the same. If you consider a microeconomic module, uh, an economist will tell you that this is very unlikely to happen because farmers are going to adapt at the intensive margin through reductions in water use, but they are also to adapt at the extensive margin, a super extensive margin, reallocating the surface of crops, which is what you have in the left hand side of the, of the slide. So this slide is basically showing a key result of our application, which is telling us that you should not assume uh, in hydroeconomic models that farmers are going to have linear responses or no response at all or basically our linear responses on water use and no response at all in land, in land allocation. What you can see here is the land use is going to change. And this is what we observe empirically. I mean, it's a finding that we have in the model, but also in real life. Uh, and they're going to use, and they're going to use because of microeconomic uh, motivations, because of the behavioral responses of the agents. And this is why it's so important. At least we consider it's very important to represent the, the, the human system in, in any water analysis, uh, water resource management analysis. Um, so using integrating the microeconomic and the hydrologic model, obviously we're going to, to have information on how much water can be saved and where. This is provided by the hydrologic model. Uh, you have information here, for example, on evapotranspiration, groundwater evapotranspiration and water yield, which are all provided from the hydrologic model. In this case, we use a SWAT, as I mentioned before, but this approach is flexible. This is why I'm not going to talk about a model specifically because the module can be populated with many different models. Indeed, we have used as far a SWAT, a HEC, uh, HMS, and also we are we are using the the, the hydrologic models that are used by the river basin authority. So the the, the models that have been developed in house by each river basin authority. So I mean the module is flexible; it can be populated with many different with many different models. In this case, we use a SWAT, and this you have here you have the, the typical um, uh, hydrologic simulations that you get from a SWAT. Well, here you have the economic implications of integrating human and water system. And this is why it's so important, in, in our opinion, to, to include, uh, to include the, the socioeconomic simulations. As I showed you before, the responses from farmers are not going to be linear. We should not expect that these responses are, are, are linear. They are going to have, um, farmers are going to have different responses depending on how much risk they are going to face with a specific crop or how much profit they are going to make with a specific crop or the management complexities that, that are involved with uh, a crop A or crop B. Um, so depending on that, they are going to reallocate their crops in very different ways. And here you have, for example, the impact on the gross value added across the basin when you apply the same water restriction. So we may expect that the response is going to be similar. What's going to be similar if we attend to the hydrologic model uh, alone and, and we assess the, the, the land use that they have, which is basically the same all the time. But here through the macroeconomic, through the, through the microeconomic model, we can see that the responses are, are quite asymmetric and we have relevant equity issues that need to be addressed. So most of the losses are concentrated upstream, while downstream, what you have is much more uh, lower um, economic impact uh, because these regions are capable of absorbing this, this, uh, the shock. So the macroeconomic, the macroeconomic model is telling you that apart from saving water, you should be also taking into account this, uh, not only the total economic impact on the area, but also the equity implications. Now let's focus on the, on the, let's provide a second, another example of how this modeling hierarchy works. In this case, we're going to focus in, uh, in the integration between the microeconomic and the macroeconomic module. Uh, this integration again works uh, recursively. So basically, we run the SOC uh, in the microeconomic module first. Then we see how, imp how it impacts uh, uh, each agent in the agricultural sector in the in the region where we want to to see the to assess uh, the, the policy, the policy impact. And then we see what are the macroeconomic implications of that. So basically, we know that if we stop producing a specific crop because it's very uh, water demanding, probably that the price of that SOC in international, in regional international markets is going to increase. 
uh, probably first going to increase in regional markets. And then if it's an important commodity uh, for trade, there may be an impact on international on international markets. And this is what we want, what we want, what we want to assess. Obviously, if you have price changes for each crop, we would expect that farmers are going to revise their decisions. So, okay, they are going to first uh, reduce water use because we increase water prices, for example, or because we reduce water allocation. But then, depending on the impact that this has on international crop prices, these farmers are going to have a response and probably will say, okay, if the price of this crop is going up and the price of crop B is going down, are going to increase the surface of crop A because its price is increasing and decrease the, the surface of crop B because the price is decreasing. And that is going to affect, again, the decision of the, of the farmer. And we do that, again, recursively until we find convergence, which in this case is assessed through changes in crop prices. So if after, well, we are we're going to run recursive simulations until in the end, the price of crops remains stable or varies less than 0 0.0001%. So that's where we assume that there is convergence already, because otherwise, in some cases, we may have a ping pong recursion approach where it never stops, but you have various, very, very small changes that do not affect the decisions of the farm. So we, we set this, this, uh, um, this uh, convergence limit. Sorry, Dino, so, I would like to just remind of the time. We've got about one minute uh, still. Ah, sorry, okay. So basically, I'm going to talk here how it works uh, very, very quickly. So here you have how in the, in the, in the first graph, you have how, how agents reallocate the land following a water chart or a water cap. You have initially a change in the surface of different crops, and then you see how crops are being affected in each simulation. So obviously, as the surface, for example, if you take a look at the oil seeds in blue, uh, initially the surface is going down quite quickly, rather quickly, but then if you, if you see the price in the water chart, is increasing. And this is, why, this, this is what explains that the surface of uh, oil seeds at some point stops from being reduced. So, and it stays basically stable because the price has gone up and the farmer decided to keep the surface, even if it's a water demanding crop and the water charge is negatively affecting the, the return that you get from that crop. But as a result of the increasing prices, this is compensating the, the income loss and the farmer decides to, to stabilize the, the, the crop of the, of the, of the, the surface of that crop. This is one example, there are many others, but I don't have time to focus on that. Uh, also, another, another important uh, outcome that we get from integrating micro and macroeconomic models. As you know, macroeconomic models work uh, at a level of disaggregation that is not very high. We may have uh, at best regions, NAT2, uh, in Europe. So in this case, for example, we have the Castilla and Leon region, NAT2 in Spain, which is the level at which the macroeconomic model is calibrated. But thanks to the microeconomic model, to the left-hand side, we have within that region, the impact disaggregated for the different agents that we have. In this case, we have 55. Now we are working with a different version in which we, are, we will have 10 times more, what 500, 550 agents. So we're going to disaggregate even, even more the, 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 the economic, uh, microeconomic model to have more agents in, the, in that one as well. So yeah, this is the last slide. So what are the developments that, that are necessary for the, for the future? Uh, well, as I said, finding convergence can be challenging in some cases, so we need to set, a, to set some convergence rules that are discretionary, and for that we may need some protocols being developed, some agreements. Um, the analysis as rapid as the sum of its parts, so obviously if you have uh, many models and you have a very complex, uh, very, very many modules, and you have a very complex model in one of the modules, then probably the, the simulation is going to take much longer. Uh, so that, that's that's a, that's a problem of the of the of the hierarchy and the protocol based modular approach. Um, then data is the data needs increase also with the number of models. So the more models you have, the more data that you need. So you want the macroeconomic and the macroeconomic models. You need to calibrate both the logic model as well. And then the great challenge because of that is uncertainty because obviously we want to address uncertainty. We need to account for modeling uncertainty and structural parameters uncertainty, which means that which means that we will we should start using more than one model at each system level. So many hydrologic models, uh, many microeconomic models, and many macroeconomic models, and that's going to increase uh, the, the the computational the computational demand uh, of the of the modeling framework exponentially. That's another challenge that we are looking to address right now. So thank you very much and apologize for the for taking so long. Well, thank you, Dean. Yeah, this looks it's fascinating. Uh, I see there are some questions uh, from uh, Bart and from Maria. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time to discuss them here, but uh, perhaps you could respond to these questions in the chat and then everyone could also see your uh, answers to those. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I'll do. Thank you. Uh, thank you again. Uh, 
so then we'll quickly move on to our uh, third presentation, uh, focusing more on, I think, on the urban scale. House of Hosen from Climate Adaptation Services is looking at uh, tools for climate stress testing in the Netherlands. So yeah. I'd like to give the word to Hasse. Thanks, Robert. Um, can you see my screen and hear me? I can see your screen and hear you. Okay, good. Um, yeah, um, I was asked to uh, uh, present uh, the concept called stress testing. Uh, that's that's uh, a relatively new phenomenon in the Netherlands. Uh, and it's about, uh, say, risk assessments, performing climate risk assessments at city scale. So I'm, uh, I'm going to talk you through that. Uh, my name is Hasse Gozen. I'm uh, with an organization called Climate Adaptation Services, which is a not-for-profit organization. Um, and we focus on making climate information accessible uh, through visualizations, websites, and tools. Um, and uh, our uh, target audience is mainly consists of municipalities, regional governments, uh, but we're also active uh, internationally. And uh, we're a spin-off organization from the Dutch government's uh, Knowledge for Climate program, which ended in 2014. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about uh, what we call the climate stress test for urban areas. Um, and this is all part of, uh, say, urban adaptation policy that was adopted in 2014, um, which in essence is about um, uh, three things or three steps. First of all, uh, mapping uh, vulnerabilities and risks related to uh, climatic hazards and then a second step is what we call risk dialogues and um, the stress test basically feeds that uh, risk dialogue so the idea is the stress test uh, will map out um, hazards and impacts and in the risk dialogue um, uh, you talk to stakeholders in the city and, and uh, they, they, there you define thresholds for, for risks and uh, you discuss the uncertainties and what all this means for uh, different sectors. And then eventually or finally this, this should lead to implementation of adaptation strategies, of course. But I will focus on the, on the stress test uh, part in this presentation. Um, well, we developed a knowledge platform, a knowledge portal. Um, you can have a look at it uh, if you're interested. It's uh, um, uh, to a large extent translated to, uh, to English, uh, www.spatialadaptation.com. And this portal guides uh, users, so the municipalities, through these uh, three steps of stress testing, risk dialogue, and uh, defining adaptation strategies. And uh, you can find a number of tools uh, that are on offer. Um, most of them are freely and open, uh, openly available. Um, and I'm going to talk about the stress testing here. So I'm going to show the climate impact atlas and the climate damage atlas that, uh, that we uh, developed. Um, yeah, and um, so the stress testing of cities, um, all municipalities have now committed to performing such a stress test. And actually, by this year, um, all municipalities have actually completed uh, this first step. So it has been quite successful. Um, and well, we uh, at CAS offer this open data tool, and we call that the Climate Atlas. Um, and this is openly available to support this first rapid assessment, um, uh, which we call stress test. Um, and what you see is um, uh, consultants then off offer more in-depth and tailored assessments um, uh, using our data or sort of following up on our uh, rapid assessment uh, activities. Um, there's also a, a guideline available uh, to municipalities which uh, guides uh, them through this, uh, this uh, assessment process. And um, there's a help desk uh, which we operate here at uh, CAS. So if people have questions uh, regarding the data, the reliability, the way the data has been generated, then uh, they come to us and we answer their uh, questions. Now, this is an example of uh, a stress test that we performed for the city of Wageningen. 
And uh, what you see here on the, on the slide is a, a simulation of a, of a, a severe uh, downpour, so a heavy rainfall event, in this case uh, 46 millimeters in one hour. And uh, here we simulate it in, in a simple way, just using a digital elevation model and some assumptions. Uh, but we did a simulation of where uh, within the city uh, local flooding uh, would occur. And um, through these types of visualizations, we also try to capture the possible impact of climate change. So here we have a more severe um, rainfall event, and uh, you can put the one on top of the other, and in that way, uh, sort of get also a visual uh, idea of what the impact of climate change uh, could mean. Um, and this data uh, is available at, at this resolution uh, covering the whole of the country. So we, we have this for all uh, municipalities openly available, but it has been generated in, in quite a simple way. So we very much encourage uh, the research institutes and, and consultancies to uh, provide more detail and go uh, and, and, uh, yeah, uh, improve on this, uh, this type of work. Um, another example here is uh, uh, urban heat uh, mapping. So we have heat maps for um, the whole of the country. And in this case, we're looking at um, the number of nights above uh, 20 degrees Celsius, so we call it warm nights, and this is the city of Amsterdam. And uh, here we developed what we call the climate lens, so a user could um, uh, swipe this lens over uh, a city and then you can see uh, the projection towards 2050. So what you see here is that the center of Amsterdam in under current climatic uh, conditions would have around uh, a week or on average per year um, of what we call warm nights. And by 2050, that would increase to over uh, a month on average per year. Um, so this is uh, uh, yeah, what we try to do to, to uh, um, bring climate information to the user through offering these types of uh, visualizations. So the, um, the stress test covers uh, urban flooding, heat stress, but also river and coastal flooding and drought uh, related impacts. And uh, the climate atlas now contains over 100 data layers. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the, this climate atlas initiative actually uh, dates back uh, to, I think, well, some 12 years ago when we started setting it up. Uh, and it's a collaboration between uh, the research institutes in our country. So uh, Deltares is involved, uh, also our Met office and the other research institutes. And um, yeah, the number of users have increased uh, uh, quite sharply. So we are now um, having around 500 unique users uh, per day. Um, if you're interested, here is the URL. So you can have a look at it. Uh, uh, yourselves. I don't have the time, unfortunately, to give you a demo now, uh, but it's all available online. Now, last year we released uh, another tool that is also openly available and also uh, aimed at uh, um, supporting this, this rapid assessment and quick uh, uh, yeah, scanning of climate risks and uh, damages. And this is uh, the Climate Damage Atlas based on the same uh, database, so it's based on the climate uh, atlas, but here we try to uh, estimate economic damages related to uh, climate change impacts. So here you can click on, on a municipality and um, it, the, the tool gives you the total uh, expected uh, climate related damage over a period of 35 years. Um, and this also feeds into this risk dialogue process. So um, uh, together with the climate atlas and this, this damage uh, indica uh, in indication, uh, dialogues are started with the sectors in the, in the city. Now, um, recently we also developed 
an application for our uh, railway organization, ProRail. Um, and also the private sector is becoming more and more interested in uh, this type of data. So we now, uh, we did some pilots with uh, the financial sector and real estate uh, organizations. Um, and um, so again, using the same open database of, uh, of hazard and uh, climate impact information, we're now capable of assessing um, climate risks in uh, real estate portfolios, for, in, for, in, uh, for instance. And um, also using this tool uh, for future acquisition, so investments in assets, one can simply uh, um, enter the address of the asset and the system will give you back an, a risk score and a risk uh, report. And, um, um, but, but the point I want to stress is that uh, um, we, we went through a very uh, uh, intense process of, of co-production together with the sector to uh, define the thresholds and to uh, discuss the underlying uncertainties. Um, and, um, uh, and, and yeah, so it, it is in a way a rapid assessment tool where you click uh, on a button and it gives you a score. But the whole idea is that you use this in a dialogue. So it is, yeah, it, it, uh, we try to um, be clear about the underlying uncertainties in the assumptions, and we really try to use it as a discussion tool. Uh, and, and yeah, that is the way that this organization is now also using it internally. Um, yeah, so looking back, I, I think the whole idea of having this uh, uh, compulsory stress test uh, adopted is, has been a great success. So all municipalities have gone through this process and it really helped to create awareness of, of climate risks and vulnerabilities and it helped to kick off this dialogue on uh, climate risk and, and uh, having dialogues on what do we find acceptable uh, and why. Now, and um, this open data climate atlas uh, lowered the threshold uh, for municipalities to perform such a stress test because uh, it lowers the cost and time uh, needed to complete this, uh, uh, this first rapid assessment. And it also stimulated a market for consultancies and commercial services. Um, and uh, yeah, but when we also say it, 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 you always need local tailoring and co-creation again to define the thresholds and to understand the underlying uh, uncertainties and things like adaptive capacity um, and uh, yeah and finally um, um, and that is maybe something for the discussion uh, can this approach be scaled up to European cities now that we have more and more open data uh, becoming available for instance through uh, Copernicus the climate data store and geos initiatives um, yeah, and that's maybe something uh, for the discussion. Um, this was my final slide, so I would like to leave it there and see if there are any questions. Thank you. Are you all still there? Sorry, you can't hear me. No, I'm not hearing <laughs> any sound. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, that was my fault. Okay. Uh, I was saying, sorry, we have uh, time for one very quick question. I didn't see something come by in the chat, but if somebody wants to raise their hand. Otherwise, I have a, well, I hope a quick question, but maybe it's for further discussion. Okay, then my question is, um, do you see, this is a very interesting tool for uh, risk analysis, I think. Uh, the climate stress. Do you see also a, a link where you can make to um, adaptation planning? So actually looking at what the effects might be of adaptation options? Yeah. Um, well, there, there, there is a, a tool actually developed by Deltares, by your colleagues, uh, called the Adaptation Support Tool, I believe. And that tool also utilizes uh, data from the Climate Atlas. 
but with that tool, you can actually design adaptation strategies and get sort of a quick feedback on uh, how effective you, the, the, the design is to solve the, the, the issues that, that we see coming from the stress test. So um, there are tools available for, for, say, more the support of adaptation design and, uh, and, and strategy development. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Hasse, again, again, for your presentation. Um, given the time, I'm afraid we do have to move on to, uh, to the final presentation of today. Uh, and that's going to be by Ambika Makande, uh, talking about the resin tools. Um, Ambika, can I ask you to uh, share your screen and then start your presentation, please? Yep, let's see if this works. Okay. Okay, can everyone see my presentation screen and hear me? Yeah, I can see it and hear you. Okay, perfect. So just to give a brief introduction to myself, my name is Ambika Markande. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Boston Center for Climate Change. Um, and today I'm going to be presenting one of the tools developed within the H2020 Resin Project. So the tool which was uh, developed by Siemens and Technalia uh, is called the Adaptation Options Library. And as discussed this morning and also following from, on from the last presentation, one of the main gaps in research relates to the lack of information on adaptation options themselves and how they're expected to perform after implementation. So the options library was created to support, at least to some extent, decision making in this respect. So just to give a brief overview of the Resin project before I go into the tool itself. So Resin was in uh, Horizon 2020 project, as I mentioned, centered around climate resilient cities and infrastructures. Uh, the project worked on developing sort of practical tools that cities could apply to support them in the design and implementation of adaptation strategies. And one of the main ambitions of the project was to develop tools and methods that could be used to push for more standardized approaches to adaptation planning and decision making in cities. Uh, so the conceptual framework, which you can see at the bottom, uh, essentially worked towards merging two central concepts. This was climate change adaptation and urban resilience. And the aim was to look at them as complementary systems uh, so that we could help urban areas to prepare for cope with and respond to some of the interrelated challenges and risks posed by climate change. Um, okay, so the Adaptation Options Library was developed as part of a suite of tools within Resin, which also included an urban adaptation e-guide, which could help users to sort of understand how to use the various tools, an interactive European climate risk typology map, and a risk-based impact and vulnerability analysis methodology. And all of these were intended to support the development of standardized decision frameworks for developing adaptation strategies. So the library is essentially an interactive database of adaptation options responding to different climate hazards. So we focused on uh, heat waves or heat stresses, different types of coastal and inland flooding and drought. And currently the library houses information from over 300 scientific and technical papers and reports um, with over 700 different sort of case or scenario um, cases. And specifically what it does is condense information on, on different characteristics and the performance of different adaptation options um, in terms of different criteria. So we look at the performance in terms of economic efficiency. So that's the cost and benefits of adaptation and physical effectiveness at the moment in terms of physical effectiveness, the library only stores information at the moment on effectiveness related to flooding and heat waves. So I thought I'd just give a really quick demonstration of how the library looks and functions. Uh, so the library has two entry points, a quick access entry point on the left and access to the, the more in-depth or complete database on the right. So I'll show you, show you how the quick action, access option works first. Um, so when you enter the uh, quick access section of the library, the user is presented with this main page and the main section shows the entire list of measures collected within the database. I think at the moment we have around 100 different adaptation measures. Uh, it has an easy search function on the top right hand side so users can search according to keywords that they're interested in and on the left hand side you can see that there are also different filter functions. So you can filter the database according to a set of criteria. So we have 
the type of hazard that you're interested in looking at, the type of implementation scale, according to different um, performance indicators, such as economic efficiency and physical um, effectiveness. So what happens when we click on a specific option? So if a user is interested in learning more about a specific option, they can use the quick search function or scroll through the list to find it um, in the list. And once they click on it, they're first presented with some brief qualitative descriptive information about the measure. When they scroll, they can find information on physical effectiveness ranges. So in this case, we're looking at green roofs as an example. So the library will store information on the adaptation in terms of heat effectiveness indicators and also flood effectiveness indicators. And then lastly, we can scroll and find information on the economic performance of the measure. So the library uses one measure for economic uh, efficiency, and that's the benefit to cost ratio. Um, and we use this as sort of the most um, standardized metric for assessing the difference between costs and benefits at the moment. Uh, when the user enters into the more complete database, this is what it looks like. Again, the list of options are displayed in the center of the information screen and the various additional filters that you can see on the left hand side. So we've got the region that they're interested in, the type of measure. So, for example, hard or soft infrastructure, the target or beneficiary of the measure, the sector it addresses, the general group of measures, for example, urban drainage systems or green infrastructures. Um, and then finally, the user can also filter according to specific adaptations or measures that they're interested in. Um, and then at the top where you see variables, um, the user can arrange or organize the data according to performance variables. And if they're interested in finding out more information about the specific options, they can select uh, study cases at the top, uh, which enables them to delve into the specific case studies with references to the actual papers or reports that were used um, to, 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 for the information that's shown in the library. Um, so the library has multiple uses with its main intended uses being researchers, planners, managers and decision makers concerned with climate change adaptation in cities. Uh, in terms of rapid assessments, the library can be used to speed up processes related to, uh, for example, the selection of adaptation measures, benchmarking or prioritizing adaptation measures according to different performance indicators. So as I mentioned, cost indicators or effectiveness indicators. Um, to design different adaptation pathways or develop adaptation portfolios, to better understand different types of measures, to support various uh, monitoring and reporting frameworks, and to extract relevant information easily uh, to support design and implementation, and to find literature for further investigation much easier. So I thought I'd give, since we're talking about rapid analysis, a really quick example of how the library can be used to support um, a type of decision process really quickly. So in this case, let's assume that the user wants to compare the effectiveness of green versus gray measures for adapting to flooding. So the user would first enter the complete database and filter measures according to the type of hazard they're interested in looking at. So in this case, we're trying to look at adaptations to flooding and then the type of measure they're interested in. So in this case, gray versus green infrastructures. Uh, next, the user would decide the type of performance criteria they want to assess. So in this case, we want to study how these measures compare in terms of flood effectiveness. So they would select flood effectiveness at the top of the screen, which then leads the display to present information related to uh, various options and different effectiveness criteria for them. Uh, and then as a fourth step, the user can select if they want a greater level of detail so they can stick with the standardized information um, that's presented here or look into the specific case studies in greater depth by selecting case studies or study cases. And then finally, the user can extract the information in CSV format, which enables them to conduct immediate analyses of the information according to their specific needs. Um, and to give a quick overview of the testing process for the library. So firstly, a major part of the resin project was to push uh, for a co-creation process between the various research organizations, institutions, and cities involved in the project. So all of our tools were co-created in close partnership with the project's four core cities. This was Paris, Manchester, Bratislava, and Bilbao. 
And this meant that those developing the tools could identify user needs more clearly. So specifically in the case of the resin project, this meant supporting cities to develop their adaptation strategies. Um, and to give an example of how the tools were incorporated in the decision making process, the overall resin methodology was applied in a case study in Bolton in Greater Manchester. Um, the city was in the process of developing a master plan to redevelop um, and revitalize the inner city. And the project organized in collaboration with 100 uh, resilient cities, a three day workshop to improve the resilience capacity of urban, urban development investments in Bolton. So the workshop was essentially framed as an integrated planning challenge and it consisted of three different elements, value sharing among stakeholders, synergy matchmaking and uh, the development of an integrated planning roadmap. Um, and then the results of the workshop then fed into a master optioneering session, which was intended to look uh, for promising and feasible urban development options. Um, and this is where the adaptation options, uh, options library comes into play. So the uh, master optioneering session consisted of three steps, identifying adaptation options at a high engineering level that are effective, profitable and fundable. So this, in this uh, case, the options library was a useful resource. Uh, the second step was to ident identify financial arrangements for funding the options. And then the third was testing whether the options are suitable and achievable. So this is just one example of how the adaptation options library can be integrated into specific planning and decision processes. Um, so of course, the potential for rapid analysis is already there to some extent. So at the moment now, we can see that the library is extremely user friendly, it's intuitive, the interface is quite nice to navigate. Uh, users don't need really any specific skills, just basic uh, computer skills uh, to navigate the system and perhaps some prior knowledge of climate risks or what they want to search for. It houses information um, on multiple uses, so on prioritiz prioritizing options, on developing pathways, finding relevant literature for researchers. Um, and this means that the information is attractive to various different actors. So we've got urban planners, risk managers, engineers, policymakers, etc. Uh, the information is pretty easy to search. It's nicely um, formatted to compare, contrast, and extract information. And it also has the two functions of quick access for those that just want a snapshot a shot of information versus more detailed access options for those that want to conduct further analysis on the information. Um, but of course, this shouldn't be seen as a quick and dirty approach to decision making. There are still important steps that are needed before the library can be used as a fully functioning rapid decision tool. So firstly, it's important to, important to consider that adaptation research is still in its early stages. There's still important work to be done to help guide our understanding of adaptation. Uh, the library is just sort of represents a first step at condensing this information, but for it to be useful in the long term, there's still several steps that need to be taken. So for one, it needs consistent updating of information and research on, for example, different types of options, the performance of options before and after implementation, performance across different temporal scales, across different regions, um, the effects of uh, the adaptations on different non-market sectors, cascading effects, and across different socioeconomic or climate climate scenarios. So we need to keep building this information for the database to be consistently useful and relevant in the long term. At the moment also users can't input information so it relies on a select few users who understand the standardization metrics to input and update the database. But ideally we, we could reach a stage where the library acts as a Wikipedia for adaptation which self-updates. Um, and then finally, it should also be seen as a complementary tool to support decision, not as a tool in and of itself. It's important to remember that decision processes also need to consider different context specific factors like local, environmental, social and economic needs. So yeah, that's it for me. Um, happy to take any questions. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Ambika. Very nice presentation. Uh, you, uh, I had a question, but you answered it already in your final slide. <laughs> Thinking about the, the feedback from users and getting that uh, back. So, I mean, it'd be excellent if you can do that. Um, I saw one question come by in the chat uh, during the session from Hasse about um, cities actively using it and getting feedback from them. I'm guessing, aside from the four case study cities that uh, you were working with in the project, um, have you had feedback from other cities? 
Yeah, so the, well, the resin project ended pretty recently, just at the end of 2018. So we're still sort of actively developing the tool and, and trying to um, help user awareness and, and having the tool actually used by, by people and cities in decision processes. At the moment now, I mean, this is one of the big challenges in H2020 projects, you know, avoiding this graveyard of tools. Um, so we need to keep thinking about how to actively maintain the database, how people can, we don't want one or two user, one or two people who know the database to keep being responsible for inputting the information because it's never going to work. So um, this is one of the main challenges of, of the tool. I think now we're, we just put in a proposal for a new H2020 project in which the tool features very prominently. So on coastal risks and adaptations specifically. Um, so yeah, this is a big challenge um, for, few, for the future. Okay. Well, thank you. I think that's about uh, what we have time for now. Um, so uh, thank you, Ambika, again for your presentation. And actually, thank you all four pres uh, presenters, Judith, uh, Dionisio, Hasse, and Ambika for your presentations this session. Um, they've all been very nice to watch and the discussion has been great um we're going to try and work this up and feed this back to the main uh workshop later on i'd like to remind everyone that there are hands-on sessions uh starting at two and then of course the um, plenary again at four so you're very welcome to join those um but i think that's it we're going to round off this session now so thank you everyone for participating and uh, presenting Thank you very much. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.